In this video, we're gonna talk about this, my first 50 BMG chambering job. Gavin Gear here from ultimatereloader.com. Here it is. My 50 BMG barreled action is done. And in this video, I'm gonna to talk to you about the barrel work from start to finish. Now, you're gonna to wanna to check out the kickoff video where I talked about all of the build components, including the International Barrels Barrel Blank, the Bat EX Action, and some of the other components like the Accurate Rifle Systems ELR chassis. We're gonna follow this up with Cerakote work at final assembly and break-in and all of that. So let's talk about barrel work. 50 BMG is literally another planet. If you're chambering a rifle for a conventional Sammy cartridge like a 308 Winchester or a 6.5 Creedmoor, things are fairly straightforward. They're well documented. If you're in a country like I am where we use English units, inches, everything is in inches and it's a pretty straightforward start to finish process. 50 BMG is an entirely different animal. It was designed as a machine gun cartridge and yet people have adapted it to match in ELR applications. So there's an entire spectrum of loose to tight and mild to wild. Okay, and I had to kind of interpret my way through this. And what I did was I got the CIP specifications, which is a European equivalent essentially of SAMI, and did some metric to inch conversions and looked at my treble tooling and made some fundamental decisions. And my goal with this is not to make this a match gun. I'm gonna follow up with something like a 375 shy tack for a real ELR rig, because this is a serious rig. For 50 BMG, my goal is versatility and fun. This is a big boomer. I wanna shoot military ball ammunition. I wanna be able to load some Hornady 750 A maxes and potentially some bore riders or other more exotic bullets. So I'll have some versatility here. I wanted to keep things fairly tight, but I did want to accommodate 50 BMG military ammo with armor piercing incendiary rounds or tracers, or these are 750 grain conventional bullets here. So I had some compromises to make and I had some fine details to plan out. In fact, this folder has all of my treble paperwork, CIP specs, a bunch of calculations that I did kind of a lot there and unlike the sammy cartridges if you're going to chamber a rifle for 50 bmg things are not as well defined there's not as many resources out there on the internet and of course anything on the internet you have to be careful who do i trust for this kind of information so that was where i started let's go over machinery and tools really quick okay so this is a supersized job so i used my supersized lathe you've seen two precision matthews machines here on the channel i've got the PM1440 GT, which is a great all, all around lathe, and I've got it down at my other shop. Ultra precision, a little bit smaller machine. The TL1660, 16 inch swing, 60 inch between centers, really big, really massive, definitely the tool for this job. I've got 18 millimeter and 12 millimeter rigid reamer holders for the body and neck and throater reamers correspondingly. I made these on the lathe. I've got another video planned. I'm going to go into much more detail with regard to how to machine these in place to get very rigid hold on your reamer and perfect alignment with the spindle. That's kind of the best of, of two worlds. <laughs> I've got the outboard spider that I built on the TL1660. It screws into the inside of the spindle. This machine has a two and a half inch spindle and I've got that down to two point three inches, I think, because I have to account for those internal threats. So still plenty of capacity for these huge barrel jobs. I upgraded the machine with a tailstock DRO, which is going to give you a real-time indication of reaming depth. And definitely that gives you a lot of precision and confidence, very important thing. And then finally, my science project, my completely autonomous <laughs> pressure flush system that is, doesn't require any modifications to the lathe. A very important aspect of reaming a 50 BMG chamber, because when I was done, I had a huge pile of stainless uh, chips. Okay, 50 BMG tooling from Treble. We've got the body and neck reamer, and we've got the throater. Now, interestingly, for this job, I had such a rigid hold on the reamer with that rigid reamer holder 
that I took the pilot bushing off and ran it without. That gave me all the oil flow that I needed to evacuate the trips. And I checked run out multiple times, practically zero. So this is a really good way to go with that. For the throater, I did use a bushing, which I custom made on the PM 1440 down at the other shop, because these bushings in this barrel would have resulted in about 2000th clearance, and I wanted to tighten that up. So I made, I made that uh, custom bushing from a brass drift punch. This is a great thing about having a lathe is you can kind of you know do do what you need to and and fine tune accordingly and not wait for custom tooling from a, a supplier. Okay, we've got three gauges here: the 50 BMG Go and No Go gauges from Treble and the freebore gauge. This gives you an indication of how long your freebore is and when you're cutting with the throater allows you to fine tune and check accordingly. Really, really good stuff. Okay, then there's the barrel extension. I started with a billet of aluminum and drilled it out. And what we've got here is we've got one by 14 on the one side, which is what we threaded the muzzle with. And then we've got five eighths, 24 on the other end. And this serves three purposes. First, it gives you support. It allows the barrel to reach all the way through the long spindle out to the spider where those set screws can steady it. Second, it allows you to blow compressed air to get the chips and the oil out when you're inspecting and doing that sort of thing. And third, it's a connection point for the pressure flush system, which is based on 5 8 24 threads. And I like to throw a thread protector on here because aluminum threads are fragile and we want to take care of that. Oh, also I laser engrave both ends because why guess, right? <laughs> We've got the action wrench over here as well from, from Bat Machine. Another consideration, and this was a big one, was through chuck capacity. I've got two and a half inch through spindle capacity on this machine, and when I looked at the gator chuck that came as a part of the true bore alignment system, it was about 1.65 inches. This barrel shank is 1.75 inches, and little preview, got a customer job I'm working on for an ultra precision ELR rifle with a TACOM HQ structured barrel. It's got a straight two inch profile on it. So I decided to max this baby out. I took a boring bar, took the chuck jaws out, bored it out to 2.050 inches because I wanted to accommodate a two inch barrel blank with a little bit of extra clearance. And while I had the chuck apart, I had the jaws out, I completely disassembled the chuck, cleaned off the factory grease, and relubricated it, reassembled it. And you can see here, I can hold this 1.75 inch barrel with room to spare. It turned out when I looked at the back of the chuck while I had it apart in the internals, I didn't want to go any more than 2.050 inches because there's some Allen screws that hold the chuck together and I was just about to bump into the counter bore for where the heads of those screws go. So I didn't know it at the time, but I completely optimized it. And had I gone any further, it would have started to get a little bit much. <laughs> okay, so the other thing we look at when we do a chambering job is the tenon print. Bat Machine supplies all of this information for the EX with the 50 BMG bolt face. We've got this particular tenon print. And there's a lot of great information here for the rifle builder. We've got 1.750 inch minimum shank diameter, which is good. That's what we got from international barrels. So we're good there. And we've got one and a half by 16 threads, which is mega sized. Most of the threading I've done is something like a one inch by 16 or a one and a 16th by 18. This is a full one and a half. Uh, but we have other information here, like what is the pitch diameter, and I use a threading micrometer. So uh, we can also calculate what our uh, go gauge stickout should be, which is 0.255. When we take the head space and we subtract off the tenon length, we get 0.255. So I do a little bit of hand calculation here. I have my reference cards by the lathe. I want to make sure I know exactly what each dimension needs to be before I go to the lathe and commit. Okay, so I started with the muzzle end work. I 
mounted the barrel in the lathe. I did a quick pre-dial to get it down to about a thousandth runoff. I parted off an inch. I've got a, a newer, really, really rigid parting tool that worked really well and I was able to just run it in. Bigger lathe with more rigidity, less problems with chatter and breaking parting tools. This is it's a big issue on smaller lathes. You have to be very careful about alignment, very careful about feeds and speeds. And usually on a smaller lathe, I'll just hack it off on a bandsaw off the lathe and then mount it and face it. Not the case with the TL1660. We just parted that baby off. Then once we've got it parted, I did a final dial on the muzzle end, uh, turned the tenon down, threaded the tenon, cut the crown. I've got some new tooling from Simtech, Simtech boring bars that work super good. That was another one of the things that I picked up from Bruce Tom and the guys over at Salmon River Solutions was what, what is the best tooling for facing and for cutting crowns. And, and these tools are just absolutely uh, amazing. And this barrel is a full inch and a half at the muzzle. I mean, it's just, it's comical how heavy and large this thing is. But I didn't, I didn't want to wimp out on anything here. And I want this to be a super heavy rifle for, for obvious reasons. Okay, with the muzzle end work done, we can now flip around the barrel in the lathe and do the breech work. This is where we really get down to business. And I'm going to break this into three parts. The first part was to face the barrel blank and turn the OD, cut the thread relief, face the shoulder and, and turn those threads, those one and a half by 16 threads. And I'll tell you, there's a bit more material to remove when you're doing a 50, uh, but it's basically the same process as the smaller barrels that I've done, a little bit more time to remove more of that bulk material. But the OD of this tenon work turned out really good. I was really happy with where things were at. It's then time to get down to business with cutting the chamber. And this is by far the biggest chamber that I've cut. I mean, let's take a look real quick. This is 50 BMG and this is six millimeter Creedmoor. So this is, this is proportional to a normal chambering job for me. This is the scale of this chambering job. And what you hope is, okay, I've, I've done my homework. I put my tooling together, I've got a rigid reamer holder, I've got pressure flush. Things should go good here. And I got really committed. This set screw right here on the rigid reamer holder goes on the flat of the reamer. So if we have a problem, we're probably going to break stuff. We're going to potentially snap the reamer off. That's a possibility. So you have to be really sure of your setup, really sure of your barrel dial in and really sure of your approach. Here, we're going for perfect forced alignment. There's no floating of anything. <laughs> so I started with a 0.1 inch plunge, and I'm looking basically at this corner right here, the largest part of the shoulder, and looking at where that enters the hole that we had drilled and we had bored true. And that was one of the things that I did before doing this that I didn't mention in that whole last section was, was the, the bulk removal, just going in with a drill bit and then going with, an aboring, with a boring bar to, to true that up and to get to the appropriate diameter, which is just under this major shoulder diameter and about a quarter inch back from where that shoulder transition will land in there, right? So right, right where the reamer is going to start going into the hole at this upper part of the shoulder. We zero this tailstock DRO and that gives us a reaming depth that's based on that shoulder transition. And if you look at the CIP specifications, you can get that distance, the distance from the breech face to that shoulder transition. You subtract off your reamer stick out because you're not going to ream that part of the chamber. These are super critical things that you need to have nailed down, measure five times and then cut once. So, after that 0.1 inch initial plunge, I took a dial test indicator and I looked at run out and I was at zero. Good sign, right? Because again, I'm not, I had taken off this floating pilot bushing. I'm, I'm counting on the rigidity of this reamer itself and I'm counting on the rigidity of the rigid reamer holder to hold things steady. So this is somewhat of an experiment to run without that pilot bushing. Okay, so after that, I knew, okay, well, I have a lot of chamber to cut. So I went in about three different passes and 
stopped periodically to check for run out and to make sure that I liked the way that the cut was looking. And here's what's amazing is you can hear those chips cutting, but this is a solid cut. You're not hearing any kind of chatter. It's just the tool doing its work. And I would occasionally put my fingers on this part of the rigid reamer holder to feel for vibrations and to feel for any movement or chatter or anything like that. And I felt basically none. Very happy with how this went. And the pressure flush, really important because there's so much material to remove from a 50 BMG chamber. So this was really confidence inspiring. This setup, which has been largely informed by Bruce Tom over at Bat Machine, is something that I'm incredibly happy with. And I, I lost track of that fear, the fear of the reamer snapping, because it was cutting so cleanly. I just didn't, I didn't have a worry about that. And then it was time for he final headspace checks. And this involved screwing on the action, using the go and the no-go gauges, and measuring, uh, tightening the action on with the no-go gauge, and looking at the feeler gauge to see where are we at. These are about six thousandths of an inch apart from go to go, no go, which is pretty tight actually for a 50 BMG. Got headspace, you know, where I wanted it, and this time I went the extra mile. I actually used the action wrench and tightened the action onto the barrel while it was still in the lathe to make sure that when the crush was accounted for, the compression of those threads, the receiver smashing up against the shoulder on the barrel, are we still going to be within the specifications we need for this particular chamber. And when I was done, I was sure. Part three is the throating process. With this reamer set up, we've got a separate throater reamer and that allows us to fine tune based on which bullets we're gonna use and what two lands distances we want for reloading exactly where we wanna be. And again, I started with a point one inch cut. I used my freeboard gauge. To, I measured the stick out and that gave me an initial number. I took subsequent passes, and here I'm just squirting cutting oil onto the reamer, not using pressure flush, because there's not a whole lot of material that's being removed here, and that worked well. I also used the ball ammo in the chamber and checked my stick out with that, and checked with a sharpied ogive of the bullet to see where things are hitting. Lots of checks and lots of uh, math and it, checking for, you know, incremental cut depths and how much I have left to go. And I ended up, this is a minimum free bore gauge here. And with the throater, I ended up going just a touch past that to accommodate the bullet jump that was desired for the 50 BMG military ball ammo. Interesting, this ammo is really old. It's manufactured in 1952. And as a part of the process on the lathe, I pulled one of the bullets. Now, I had to go over to the milling machine. I used a half inch collet, tighten it down, and then used the vise and a shell holder to just use the quill to pull, pull it out. So here's some powder that hasn't seen air since 1952. Pretty interesting stuff. Uh, probably about 200, 200, 250 grains, somewhere in that range. I'll, I'll weigh it a little bit later. But with this, I can check on the lathe with an unfired case and compare what I'm getting with the go and no-go gauges, that kind of thing, and not have the bullet interfering. And then use loaded ball ammo when I want to do the checks with the bullet. So it'd be nice if I had my components. I don't have my Hornady brass yet. I don't uh, have some of the other bullets that we'll be working with, no loaded ammo with the Hornady 750 AMAX. So I had to make do with what information I had. And I, I called a few different people, Bruce and Daryl at Bat Machine. I talked to Dave Manson, a lot of people that I really trust and respect and kind of got their input on, on what to do for this to optimize this particular job. And with that, we were done. So it was time to cut the chamber transition and polish the inside of the chamber with some, I think 250 grit, approximately sandpaper on a dowel clean it all out and remove it from the lathe. I then took it down to our gunsmithing shop where I have a 50 watt fiber laser and I did the laser engraving. So 
What I like to do for that is to screw the action on so that I know where things are going to clock. You can see it's not even fully tightened right here. And then we set it in the bed of the laser engraver and plan for the appropriate clocking. Now I know this is going to move just a little bit, maybe a degree when we tighten it back down in the barrel vise after Cerakote. But I just wanted to make sure that we were placed in kind of the, the correct general vicinity, if you will. And I increased the size of the letters a little bit. I think I ran an extra pass on this because I want a little bit more clarity after Cerakoting. This has kind of been an incremental process of getting the right settings and the right dimensions. Uh, but a fiber laser does a fabulous job at engraving the barrel. So I took a lot of time on this job, probably two or three times the amount of time that I normally spend on a chambering job. Part of that was calculations and, and reaching out to the industry for insights and, and resources and information. Part of that was some of the special tooling that I made for this particular job. And it's all worthwhile. It's all very much worth it because now when I go to build another 50 or when I built, you know, turn the, the 375 shy tack barrel, if we, if we go that direction with this subsequent follow-up build, I will be better prepared. And I have tooling that is really uh, running well on the lathe and a higher level of confidence with it all. Okay, so what's next? We've got the full Cerakote job, the Accurate Rifle Systems ELR chassis, the barreled action, and like always, we're gonna go to the highest level of craftsmanship. We're not going to apply Cerakote where we don't want it. H-series Cerakote is not a low friction coating, so we're not going to use it on extraction cam surface. We're not going to use it on bolt OD or the inside of the receiver. Very, very picky and selective about how Cerakote is applied, but it is well worth it. The bedding job and final assembly. I've got to circle back with some folks. I believe I will be bedding it. I uh, might be trying a, a different bedding compound this time. So that'll be interesting to take a look at. And then at that point, it's just final assembly, break in, and a whole heck of a lot of fun. So I hope you'll join us. Make sure you're subscribed with notifications. Uh, this build will be great to follow. I've got a bunch of other stuff too, uh, more than I could even talk about here. Lots of cool builds coming up. So I appreciate you all. I'm glad that uh, you're along the ride for, for this particular adventure. And I'd like to hear from you. If you have feedback on my custom tooling setup, the barrel blank, the action, the lathe, any of it, drop a comment and let's start a discussion. That concludes this video and that means it's time to wrap it up. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, we're on Facebook, YouTube, Rumble, where we've got unrestricted content and Instagram, make sure to follow us on all those channels. Ultimate Reloader also has a commercial solutions division serving law enforcement, the military, and the gun industry. We have some unique capabilities, including a comprehensive suite of recoil testing and evaluation capabilities, trigger profiling, and more. If you're interested in custom rifles like what we build here on the channel or gunsmithing services, you're gonna to wanna to go to rifles.ultimatereloader.com and get on the wait list. If you're interested in becoming a professional gunsmith, check out the Sonoran Desert Institute. They've got a degree program, they've got a certificate program, and you can study from home. Learn more at sdi.edu. Thanks again for watching.